So we're going to continue our discussion of the principles and details of Hachnasat Orchim. What does Hachnasat Orchim mean? Yes, Lior. Welcoming guests. Welcoming guests. And we did last class, spend a whole bunch of time discussing the importance of the mitzvah, how it even exceeds the study of Torah, the great magnitude of that mitzvah. And we spoke about Avram Avinu. We're going to revisit Avram Avinu right now because he's going to be the archetype. Remember the first time we meet Abraham, Avraham, really meet him in the Torah, he's welcoming guests. That is not a coincidence. And he is really considered to be the first Jew. So something's going on over here, right? The fact they put those two together is important. We're on page 51. Let's look at the Chofetz Chaim, Rabbi Yisrael Meir Kagan Kohen, who died right before World War II and is considered to be one of the most important Jewish thinkers of the last century. He wrote a book called Ahavat Chesed, Love of Doing Kindness. Let's see what he has to say about this topic. And he says, At the beginning of the description of the Avram Vinu episode, The first thing we know is that he was still sick from his Brit Mila circumcision that he had at the age of 99, right? The even though he was in tremendous pain and hardship, even so, he sat at the entrance to his tent. at the hottest part of the day. Liro to see, or lie, perhaps. There's two ways to say perhaps in Hebrew. One of them is ulai, maybe. The other is pen, peinun. Peinun means something bad's going to happen, lest. Right? Maybe something bad will happen. So that's peinun, pen, something bad. Ulai means perhaps something good's going to happen. And for him, it was a good thing. He wanted guests. Lerot, Ulai Yira Merachok, Eza Over, maybe he'll see in the distance some passing person, Bishavi, Khan, Sula Beta, he'll come and go to his house, the Kasher Ra'am, and as soon as he saw them, rats, he ran. We spoke about that last class, if you remember. Likratam, Venishtachech Lefneim, and he bowed down before them, Vidaber Leim, and he spoke to them, Devan Rachim, nice words. They'd be like, uh, you need somewhere to go? No, okay, fine, off you go. He wanted to speak rachim, nice, soft words to them, please. So they could enter into his house. Turn over the page. That was the description we already knew. That was just a recap. Okay, we're not at this level, says the Chobz Chaim. We're not expected to be outside after a major operation, yeah, in the heat of the day when he forgets. That's not us. We understand that. But that's okay. Even though we look at these stories of great people, like, I can never do that, that's fine. Right? If you want to learn how to become a great violinist, you go watch the great people, but you're never going to be that good. That's okay. You watch great people in order to learn from them, hopefully to get a little bit, a smidge, a little bit of who they are. Page 52. Even though we're not at the level that we could do this. Alcohol panim. Even so, says the Chavit Chaim, Nil mon we should learn from this. You should welcome the... Oh, I've got something to tell you. I have something to tell you. just came to my head right now. We'll finish this up in a second. hope the Chavis Chaim doesn't mind. We spoke about um, visiting the sick a few classes ago, remember the beginning of the semester? Right? We did judge people favorably. They're visiting the sick. Can I tell you the story about that friend of mine who had a heart attack many years ago and to visit him? Mm -hmm. This happened a number of years ago. I was away on Sunday, I was in Pennsylvania with my family, and I got a text that he had another heart attack and a stroke. Same guy. So I was in Pennsylvania, I couldn't, you know, I couldn't leave right there and then. But the next day I left my wife and kids there, and I drove down two and a half hours down to, uh, to the hospital, to Jamaica, where he, he's actually still there, to visit him. And I was thinking, you know what? We just learned the laws of this. So I had some food with me, and I went to visit him, and um, not great, not great. I was there, thank God, when I turned up, at least his appetite, this was a few, two days later, at least his appetite was up a little bit, you know? His appetite was good. Actually, by the way, the fact that he was alive was a miracle in of itself. Uh, a friend of ours hadn't seen him in a while. and said, you know what, let me just pop in to visit, see how he's doing. And I haven't seen him in a while. 
Then he walked to his house, he knocked on the door, he opened the door, he said he was completely covered in sweat. It's like his shirt was soaking wet. He said, are you okay? He goes, yeah, I'm fine, I'm fine, which is typical him. And he went to lie on the sofa and he realized that he was in bad condition. He called the ambulance, the ambulance turned up, had Sala turned up in, he said, literally 90 seconds, boop, straight there. And he realized, had he not come at that moment, the guy wouldn't have been able to get off the sofa to open the door for him. Literally turned up, I mean, mirac it was literally a miracle. At that moment, two minutes later, that would have been it. And he was having a heart attack and a stroke together, which supposedly is unusual, I don't know, but that's what they say. Anyway, so he got to the hospital and uh, he had to give emergency, they opened him up, did emergency stent work. So I had turned up already, he was standing, but he can't speak or barely say a few words here or there. So they brought in, they have like kosher food there, you know? So they brought in the food. So I opened it up for him. And I remember from last, I remember last time, I brought my book. So I got the food and I cut it into small pieces for him. I was standing there for like 20 minutes, like feeding him, you know? I was only there for a few hours. I mean, there's people that you are staying all night, leaving their wife and kids to take care of him because his family are abroad. He's here by himself, you know? He hasn't got insurance. It's a, it's a big, big mess. You know, it's weird. So it just happened as we were studying this. Just like, while I was doing, it, I was like, "Wow, I'm just studying this with my class." You know. I share a four shleima. This Torah will hopefully give him a four shleima. Okay. So he says, even so, even though we're not at that level, still we have to take a little bit of it. We should learn from it. He says, "Lekablam bechibe seira to accept that with happiness." This is important, by the way. Part of this mitzvah is when you have guests in your home. We'll see which type of guests in a moment. When you do invite them, you can't be like, yeah, what do you want? <laughs> you know, it's gosh. You know, I, I mean, we don't naturally do that, but you want to, you have to make them feel not just physically welcome, but also emotionally welcome. Asher Gadol, imagine you're welcoming a very rich person to your house. Imagine if every person came as a guest into your home, you welcome them like you welcomed, uh, I don't know, the president of America. And we're like, yeah, come in, yeah, there's something in the fridge. You grab some of your stuff, you know. Imagine that. That's how you're doing it. And remember, we said from last class, because actually what you're welcoming is the Pnei Shechina. You're welcoming God because every person is made in the image of God. Remember that? So we're welcoming God in as well. Okay? And actually, this mitzvah isn't just for poor people. This mitzvah is for rich or poor people. Is it the Chav Look at down note two. V'da, you should know. de mitzvah lachas orachim noheg afashirim. This is not just welcoming poor people into your house. The Afshain Srifa and Tobasar, let's say they don't need you. They got they live in a mansion down the street. And they come to your little humble abode into your home. You were like, they don't need me, they live down the street. They got a mansion. The whole time says, no, it's a mistake. This mitzvah applies to poor or rich people. Even if they have a night, they don't need your goodness. Ah filuhachi kabala shimakabal osam, the way you accept them, but panami afot. You should greet them with a Happy and cheerful expression. This actually is found in Pirkei Avot. That is where he's getting it from. Have a koladam panim We said, welcome every person with a happy face. Page fifty-two. This is not, this is Torah. This is not cutesy advice you stick in your fridge. This is the mitzvah. l'shamsham And you should try very hard to serve them and to honor them according to their level of honor. He mitzvah, that is the mitzvah of That is the mitzvah. So what exactly do you have to provide them with? Look at the bottom of page 52. So we know from Avraham, what did Avraham do? Well, let's use him as the archetype. Bottom of page 52. He said, Take some water, wash your raglechem, wash your feet, and have a shluf. So what did he do? Three things. He gave them water, he gave them water, he gave them water, he gave them water, he helped them wash, and he gave them a place to rest, right? And then, the ekha pat lechem, he gave him a little bit of bread, and he said, v'sa'aru libchem achat over before you pass, have some food as well. Now, we know he gave him a big, you know, five-course meal, but that's what he offered them. It says the Chovetz Chaim on this, achar kach bikesh Avram avinu la'orachim, afterwards, Avram told the guests to rest under the tree, right? Why? Shabbatoch kach, because while they were resting, he was able to prepare the food. Remember, he got Yishmael involved, he got his wife involved, cut involved, he got the bread, he made the meat. 
And he said, Rest under the tree, in the shade. Because that's where the shade is. And be able to rest after your very difficult day. We learn something out from this is the Chavitz Chaim. What do we learn? Before you offer your guest food, you should offer them a place to rest. Now they may not want to rest, and you don't have to shove them into bed, right? But you should offer them a time to, it's not just, you're not just at the feet, okay, come in, take a seat at the table. I'm like, are you tired? You look tired. Use the bathroom. There's a, there's, there's a couch for you if you want to rest, or if you want to, there's a bed for you. Have a little rest yourself. Right? Offer them someone to rest is a mitzvah. Let's say you're very, very rich and wealthy and you have lots of maids. I visit someone here in the city. He has about 20 people who run his house for him. Don't ask what they do, I have no clue. But he has 20 people who are there to take care of you, open the door for you, feed you, literally, run the house. Not family members, people who run the house for him. He's a very successful guy. He could very easily say, right, you take care of that, you take care of that. I take this is a problem. Uh, this is not the derech to be. Avravina was very wealthy. He could have had servants serve these guests. He wanted to do it himself. As it says in Bereshit, Yud Chet Chet, 18.8, V'hu amad alem tachat ha'eit v'yachelu. He stood under the tree with them and they ate. He was there to watch them and he himself got involved. Says the Chovetz Chaim, look at page 53. He himself stood. He didn't get any of his servants to do it. The entire time they were eating, he was there to watch them and make sure they were okay. Yeah? By the way, you all see Moshe Rabbeinu. Remember, Moshe Rabbeinu was visited by his father-in-law, Yisro, Jethro. Yisro came to visit. Moshe Rabbeinu went out to greet him, then Aaron went, and all the Jewish people went. And then they had a big meal, and then Moshe Rabbeinu's name is not mentioned again. Why not? Because he was serving them. He didn't sit down to eat. Moshe Rabbeinu, the leader of the Jewish people, the greatest prophet ever lived, had guests. He was the one serving his guests. Believe me, there were many other people he could have got to do the job, but he wanted it, and so much so that his name is removed from that chapter because he was the servant. He wasn't actually eating the meal. You hear? Write that down, you're gonna need it. When Yisro came to visit. Katvas from Hagadoshim, the holy books write, says the Chavis Chaim, bottom page 53, look inside. Kishiavoa orachim lebeito, shall Adam, when a person comes to visit them, ye kablam besev panim, if you should greet them with a happy face. Right? It should be like, yeah, like, yeah. like, welcome! You're tired, you're irritated. Welcome! That's the way to do it. The Asimiyad Lefnehem immediately give them Lechol, something to eat. Kuulaya Ani Rav, Mujba Shashon. Maybe he's, he's a poor person and he's embarrassed to ask for food. Right? What, what, what do the Persians call it? Not rough, right? Like, oh no, I'm not hungry. Oh, they're hungry. You can hear their stomach rumbling from a distance. Oh, they're hungry. Right? You've got to offer them and you offer them and offer them. Vietelhem. You should feed them with a smile on your face. That is the mitzvah. He's telling you how to do this mitzvah. How to keep Shabbat? You don't drive, you don't turn on lights. How to put tefillin on? You wrap around your arm, make a brach. How do you do this? You do it with a smile on your face. That's how you perform this mitzvah. Even if you have something in your heart, listen very carefully, that is bothering you and you're irritated, you're having a bad day, which you're always having constantly. You can't tell him. You should hide that. You should hide that. Don't let them see that. Your face, say the rabbi, say Chazal, is Rishut Harabim. Rishut Harabim means, means, pen. Do you mind getting me um, a pen from SD Bridge? Do you mind? Do you know where she is? The office right over there, yeah. Oh, thank you so much. All right, it's down. 
Your face is Rishut HaRabim. Rishut HaRabim means the public domain. Your face doesn't belong to you. What does that mean, your face doesn't belong to you? Who does it belong to? Everybody else. Your face belongs to everybody else. Why? Because you don't see it. Because you don't see it. I looked at my face for two minutes this morning. I look fine, brush my teeth, I'm out. You people have been looking at my face a lot more than I have today. You're welcome. I'm good like that. Right, your face not belong to you. The way you act, the way you treat people, the way your face that you do. Put her marker, because I feel like you were talking about that. Yeah, that's it. Thanks. Okay. So your face is the public domain. Right? Your panim is the reshut harabim. Your face is the public domain. Your face, your panim, reveals your, this is your panim, but it also reveals your penim, your insides. Right? Panim means inside. Because when you look at a person's face, you know how they're doing inside. So it's very easy for you to be miserable and smirk because that's how you feel inside. You've got to change your panim by changing your panim. By smiling, you make yourself feel better. And that's what you have to present to other people. You're having a bad day, so you feel miserable, you look miserable. Right? Having a bad day, you feel miserable. Right? This is the public domain. Your face belongs to everybody else. So your panim and your pinim are, are, and your pinim are, rela are related. Okay? So I don't feel like smiling. I don't feel like being, hey, how you doing, right? You gotta force it out. Eventually, your panim will affect your pinim. You start to feel better, right, Leo? You're always smiling, Leo. Are you ever miserable? Nah, good girl. Okay, even if you are, still smile. So he says, what are we up to? Ah, at the bottom of page 53. Uh, if you have something dava daga, right? You should hide it in front of them. And you should speak nicely to them. Hello, how are you? How are you feeling today? Say nice words to them. And this will make them feel comfortable. Sit them down and be like, Hi, how are you? Let me tell you about all my problems. My life is terrible. Everything is horrible. All right? You're not welcoming a therapist into your house. If you are, and you pay them, then you can. But they're not there to be your therapist. You should speak nice words to them, and you should not talk about all your troubles. Right? Because you're going to make them feel despondent. There's some people who do that, right? Some people, you know, you talk to them, they're always just, always like terrible stories. You ever have that? You got one friend? You ever, you ever had that person before? It's like always got the, like the worst. How are you? Things are well? Everything's terrible. My life, and they just cut, and they're like, oh, God, I feel depressed. You know? They can never be like, this is not, okay, there's times you should, friends are there to impart your problems and troubles to, but not constantly. And not if you're the host. You have to break their spirit with all the depressing news. By the end, they'll give you a check. Right? They thought maybe I'm the one who's causing all this trouble because I'm, I'm schlepping into the house. And because of this, right, he thinks that, you know, you're losing money. They're losing money because of you, you know? Your guest is going to feel that they're the source of all your problems, which they could be. But you have to inform them of that. Turn over to page 54. While well, the guest is eating, says the Chofetz Chaim, but the Chofetz Chaim wrote a lot of books on halacha, right? The Mishnah Brura is the Chofetz Chaim's, you know, commentary on the Shulchan Aruch and the Ramah. So he could have spent his whole time discussing other mitzvot. He had other stuff to write. He felt he had to go in details and give the details of these mitzvot. Uvishata Ochel, and when the guest is eating, you have to say stuff like, I wish I could give you better food. Ah, oh, you know, I'm giving you chicken. I wish I'd give you a steak. Because you like steak, right? You're like non-vegetarian. 
I meant a tofu steak. I, whatever it is vegetarians eat nowadays. I, I wish I could give this to you. I just, I just don't have it. I, I, I apologize. That's how you have to talk to them. I wish I could give you more. I wish I had better food for you. Right? And he actually quotes a verse, a verse from Isaiah, which means Isaiah the prophet hinted at this idea in his prophecy. I mean, that's why he's quoting him. And offer your soul to the hungry. Satisfy an afflicted soul, basically. Not just with food, but with words and desires. Ratzon lomar, ratzon tov. In other words, show them goodwill. That's wild. And he's going to quote Isaiah the prophet again, chapter fifty-eight, seven. Itab zohar ve The zohar quotes on the verse on the on the verse from Isaiah. Halo pros mecha. You shall surely break your bread for the hungry. So Isaiah the prophet's got to say that. Isaiah the prophet could have said a lot of things. He's like, give bread to hungry people. Says the Zohar, his commentary on this verse. Look at, look at page 54 inside. The host should slice the bread in the presence of the guests. So that they might be, they won't be embarrassed. Right? Ah, maybe embarrassed to cut it themselves. You should offer them the portions, because if they take their own portions, they may take smaller portions. You should offer the portions yourself. The And you should not embarrass a guest. And by the way, this is halacha in general, by the way. Many people are not aware of this halacha. You shouldn't embarrass a person by watching them eat. Which is, by the way, the worst thing. You see with somebody, they're like, I can eat all of that. <laughs> they watch the food go in. Wow. You sure eat a lot. Right? That is against halacha. You shouldn't comment on a person's eating habits. You shouldn't comment on what's on their plate. And you shouldn't watch them eat. That is halacha. He's quoting the Zohar based upon the prophet Isaiah that the Chavis Chaim says you shouldn't embarrass a guest by watching them eat. You enjoying that? Right? That's not embarrassing. But that's actually a halacha for anybody, by the way. Not just guests. Right? Watching a person eat. Maybe I'm not aware of that halacha. I remember learning that many years ago when I was like 19 years old. I was like, really? I was a yeshiva in Israel before I went to university. I remember learning the halacha. He said, you should watch a person eat. I was like, how strange is that? It's fun to watch people eat. I'm saying, well, the food goes everywhere, all the juice comes out. It's like entertaining. It's like, you know. But you shouldn't do that. It's embarrassing to them. Right? Okay. So we said food. Now talk about sleeping facilities. Okay. And we're going to learn about Avram Avinu and his Eishau. Let's see. The Imya Lina Metzla, if the guests are spending the night in your home, which is going to happen sometimes, Etzla, you shall give them the best bedding. You've got a bed in the house that's a good bed, give it to the guests. This actually has happened to me. We have beds when we got married. I married my wife moons ago. And uh, we bought beds, all right? Well, we had no money then. So we bought you know, cheap beds and then we got this new house, so we bought a, best, a, a bed for the guest room. So we bought a nice bed. So we got it in, and later I was like, oh, this bed is so brand new, posturpedic bed, you know, like a real good one. I laid down in it, my wife says, get off the bed. I'm like, but I'll take this one, and we'll give my bed, our bed, to the guest room. Right, that's not so bad. My wife was like, no. Oh, the guest room has the better bed. I was like, but it's hardly ever used once every few weeks. I'll sleep in my bed every night. I'll get the good bed. I'll get, my bed's okay. It's not as comfortable as this one. She's like, the guest room's got the better bed. Sometimes I sleep. Sometimes I sneak in there. I have a little, like, lie down on it. My wife was like, you're messing the bed up. It's the guest bed. I was like, we have no guests. Get off. I'm, like, I'm a guest. Off the bed. 
I didn't realize at the time, but this is the Chavetz Chaim's point. You should give them better bedding. You got one pillow that's a nice pillow, give them that. Now they guess, just give them that flat pillow that doesn't feather up, you know? That, like a pancake pillow, you know, the one doesn't? It's like lying down in the bed itself. What like lying on a brick. Come off? Like what if it's not a guest? Like, What's not a guest technically? Who's not a guest technically? That's called a guest. A person that sleeps over all the time is a guest. If they don't live there and they need your sleeping facilities, that's a guest. I thought you were going to say, what is it, family? <laughs> that's, that's what I thought you were going to say. I don't know if you're thinking that. <laughs> they are also guests. When family come and visit, like that's my mother-in-law, shove her in the basement. <laughs> I'm saying, but we, 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 we inflated a bed for you in the garage. Off you go, love. No, that's, that's not the way it works. You may be tempted to do that. But that's not the way to be, right? Even family come to visit, even they come often, they're considered guests. They're considered guests. She says, so she says, but I'm telling you the halacha, this is the Chavis Chaim speaking. This is the leader of the generation, right? He says, because a person sleeps better in a good bed. We know that. Sleepies for the rest of your life, right? Don't we? Mattress? Yeah, sorry, yes. Can't you have like the same bed, use the same bed as the guests? As in, you have the same mattress, but they're in separate rooms, but they're the same quality. Yeah, that's fine. As long as it's, yeah, if you have nothing bad, then that's it. But if there is a difference, they should get it. They should get it. So he says, I'm not making this up. Don't shoot the messenger. Sometimes people enjoy a good rest and a good bed more than a good meal. I like a good meal and a good bed. Just a warning over there. The, but some of people enjoy a good bed and a good meal, you know? The Yoma Belibo, Eloyiti Mitarach Etzel Zeb, Vadayiti Rotesh, Yechavdu Vichlu. He says, Let's say, how do you motivate yourself? You say, Because if I was a guest, how would I want to be treated? You should love others like you love yourself. You love a good night's sleep, make sure they get a good night's sleep. If you like a good meal, then you get a good meal. You don't want to be bothered all day and all night, then don't let them be bothered all day and all night. You should think about yourself, use yourself as the a person, because you never know, says the Gemara, where you're going to end up. Right now, you have a big house and everything's comfortable for you. It could be you end up as a guest yourself and have to rely upon other people. Like I'm going to be this weekend. I'm going to be in Great Nick this Shabbat. Oh, okay. Shabbat. Oh, you rather come? Rather come, sure? Oh, my God, I'm going to go there. That's your shawl as well? That's my, that's the I'm going to be there. Uh, wait, how do you, how do you oh, I know the peeps there. Really? Okay, Shall let's talk about the Eishel of Avraham Avinu. Write this down. Avraham Avinu had an Eishel. What's an Eishel? Exactly. That's the question. What exactly is an Eishel? <laughs> let's discover that together. There's going to be a number of interpretations to what it is. But there's, like, there's even restaurants called this now, right? But that's not exactly what it was. Well, some say it was actually. The Eishel of Avraham. The Eishel of Avraham. What is this Eishel? So the basic understanding, if you look at it, it's a tree. A tree. The tree of Abraham. Maybe this is the tree that his guests would rest under when they would come to visit him. So if you look aside the various uh, Chumashem, the, uh, the Torahs, they'll say it was the, 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 the tree of Avram Avinu. Right? And that would seem to make sense, because if you look at the verse, this is from Bereshit, look on page 55. We're finishing this chapter today, people. So come with me. On a journey through time and space. Vayita Eishel Bever Sheva. Avram Avinu Planted by Yitta and Eishel, you see it? But Be'er Sheva, in Be'er, where's Be'er Sheva? Where's Be'er Sheva? South, south of Israel. Of Israel. Yeah. You know that, you're from Israel. They thought it was outside like New Jersey. Yes, in the south of Israel. What's it like down there? It's really hot and muggy, and there's a lot of Bedouins. A lot of hot and a lot of Bedouins, who, by the way, are very good at Achnas at Orchim. They're very good at this mitzvah. They make this, they make this their thing, you know, Achnas at Orchim. 
It comes from this tradition, by the way. That's awesome. Yeah. But you tell So you planted an Eishel and Beshev. So you just read that. You're like, what do you plant? Trees. So I'm going to plant an Eishel. They crush Sham, Beshem Hashem, Kelolam. And he called out there in the name of God, Master of the Universe. He planted a tree in Beersheva, and he called out there the name of God. What is going on in there? We need Rashi. Rashi says this Eishel wasn't an actual tree, or maybe it was as well. But in addition to just being a tree, it was a pundak. A pundak is a, an inn, a motel, a hotel. He created a hotel. La lun bo orchim, says Rashi, that guests could rest. So he had a house, and then he set up another location for his guests. And he says, actually, Eishel is a notarikun, which is the Hebrew word for an acronym. Loshon Eishel, who, what is it? He says, Eishel is actually three things. Eishel is, so the tree we have, Eishel is Aleph, Achila, Shin is Shtia, and the Lamed is the Via. So you have eating, you have eating, you have drinking, and you have escorting, escorting. That's the a -shell. He would feed them, he would give them to drink, he would give them to drink, and he would make sure they were escorted on the way. We'll see what the escorting thing is all about. We haven't discussed that yet. It's not about getting them in, but you're also gonna figure out a way to get them out. That's not so simple, by the way. Not so simple. Okay, that's a -shell. Write that down. That's the kind of question I've put in the midterm. I'm just, I just throw that out there. <laughs> if I was a stern student right now in your position, I'd be underlining and writing this one down. Says the Chavis Chaim, Ubi Prat. Ah, so let, we, the first, we spoke about the first ones, right? So eating, drinking, and resting. He was an inn, so they would sleep there, and he would give them to eat and drink. Okay. So what's this idea of Leviag, of escorting guests? So it's actually a very important myth that most people are not aware of, which still applies today. It's changed a little bit to the olden days, but it still exists. And it goes like this. Let's say your guest doesn't know the way. Okay. Now, now we have GPS, and now we have, you know, Waze, and all these other wonderful Jewish inventions. I don't know about GPS, but Waze definitely is. And the way goes the various paths. He's not which, let's say it's Shabbat, and he can't use his, you know, his phone. And they don't know exactly where they're going afterwards, which happens, right? There's many paths they could take. Mitzvah Rabbah. Mitzvah Rabbah, says the Chavah It's a great mitzvah. Leilech ito, to go with your guest. Olaharotlo, and to show your guest. Or al kolpalem levarerlo, at least to explain to your guest. Hate have well. So the person will not get lost and stumble because of you. What does that mean? That means that they're, once they leave the house, you're like, okay, they're at my front door, they're on their own. You have an obligation to make sure your guest gets home safely. If they don't, it could be your culpable for it. Does anyone know of a mitzvah in the Torah where we see this idea in action? One of the Tariag mitzvah, one of the 630 mitzvot, where we see this idea in play, where you are responsible for a person that leaves your city. Yeah? That's not what I was going to say. Okay, you said what you were going to say then, Leo. I just thought, um, I, was, um, like, I just think it's kind of similar to um, if you don't, then it's like, oh, it's your fault that they died. Oh, so like, oh, oh, that's also it's true. Like, it's, not, it's not you getting lost, like it's their fault. Very, very similar. Too. If you're right, if you don't go, that's what, that's what Rabbi Kiva said. You said, if you don't visit the sick, you're responsible. There is responsibility if you don't do something for them. Same thing over here. Yes, that is true. Another question. That is true. Yeah. Just like on the previous point, what's the Hebrew word for acronym? Notarikon. It's not used too often. It's written over there. Notarikon. <laughs> 
and you're welcome. There is a mitzvah called the Egla Arufa. Anyone heard of this mitzvah, the Egla Arufa? The Egla Arufa is the following scenario. You find a dead body outside of a city, lying there. What you do is, you t the, the people come out, the heads of the town come out, and they measure the distance of that dead body to the closest town, because it's the middle of somewhere. They find the closest town, the people of that town, there's an assumption, there's an assumption, rightly or wrongly, but it's the assumption that's made, that this person had come from that town. That's the closest town. We assume it came from that town, okay? So what do you do? The heads of that town have to do a form of repentance for this person. They have to make sure the body gets a good burial. They take a young calf, it's killed, the blood is sprinkled, it's then taken to a fast-passing stream and they wash their hands over the blood. A whole ceremony that's done. And they say the idea is that they have to prove and actually do to shoot repentance because it could be they weren't careful when this person left town. Maybe the people who housed this person and, and hosted them, right, didn't take care to make sure they go home safely. They become responsible for this person. They become responsible for this person and they have to do repentance for not taking care of them. And they have to, as it were, wash their hands of their responsibility. This is actually one of the reasons we wash our hands when we leave a cemetery. Because maybe we're responsible for someone's death inside the cemetery, so we wash our hands when leaving. That's actually the reason we wash our hands after a cemetery with a, with a vessel. Okay. So too, how do you prevent this? What should have happened before the Egla Rufa Mitzvah kicked in? And the answer is that before this person left, you have to make sure, do you know where you're going? Do you know how to get there? Do you have Tzela Derech? you have Tzela, you have food preparations for your journey. They have food, they have water. You're responsible for this person. So the Chavaz Chaim, actually you have to walk them home, or at least half the way, or at least part of the way. Let's just finish this for one second, Emily. I'm going to come to you in one second. Okay. Lufikach. Kashei Yatzel Aderech. Malavano. So you have to escort them. You have to escort them. Right? The Nostan El Soma Kavod. Because you have to, in effect, you're giving the divine image, you're escorting God when, they, when this person leaves. We see a person in the divine image, every person. Shei Manichon associates a Bilvado. He should go by themselves. That's how they keep their honor. They're just like, bye, close the door, see ya. Don't let the door hit you on the way out. The im ein malavan so. If you don't, and this is a little bit what you were saying, Lior, let's say you don't escort them. You're killing them. Your inaction is as though you've done an action. Pirush and not klimameno. Salma shadam nivrab salamakim. You've robbed them. Of the divine presence that's inside them. Right? You've taken out the true divine image from them, and that's really death. Yeah. <coughs> I went on a Torah course. Yeah. And the people I stayed at, they were awesome at this mitzvah. Yeah. Yeah. They like they give us full access to their academy cabinet, and then we went over to a different person's house, and they offered to escort us back. We were stupid, and we didn't let them escort us, which now I realize was really, really dumb because in hindsight we got lost. And we deprived them of a the mitzvah. Ah, uh, right. If they want to do it, let them come with you. Very good. Kevan shitzchil alav so dalad amot gam ba'ir. Now. Nowadays, um, you have to show the desire. Hari kavanato vedato latzila b'derech. Once you've begun to accompany the other person at least a few steps, you've shown the desire and wish to protect them. By the way, this protection isn't just physical; it's also spiritual, right? Just your, just, even if you can't go the entire way. Just going a little bit of the way, you show that you're there for them. So nowadays, this mitzvah we're going to see may not be that you have to go very, very far. Even going daladamot out of your door or maybe out of your property is sufficient for this. All right? So if someone comes to me, I usually walk out. If they've got a car with them, I'm not going to follow them in my car, but I walk them to their car. I walk them to their car. You know, so you know how you're going? It's because I'm going. I've got, yeah, okay, fine. You know? You have to you have to go with them but just going those few steps 
actually, says the Marsha, gives them protection. Okay? And the explanation is that certain angels, right, escort the person once you go with them and will escort them the rest of the way. There's a metaphysical aspect to this as well. There's certain malachim that protect a person when they go. By you going with them a little bit, you're kind of like welcoming and you're kind of escorting them and those angels as well. So let's take with this halacha as it was originally. The Rambam says on page 16, sorry, page 56, the kamashiyor love how far does the person have to go? So the Rambam in Hilchat Avelut, Laws of uh, Mourning, Harav Talmud Ad Ivur Shal Ir, a Torah teacher should accompany his disciple until outside the city. Imagine that. Ha'ish Chaveru Ad Chum Shabbos, one friend should accompany them to the Sabbath limits, which is about 2,000 amot or about a kilometer outside the city. One should accompany a Torah teacher about a parsa, which is four and a half kilometers. Right? They were th- it was dangerous to travel. You had to literally go miles. And he says, if your guest, he says, Vimaya Rabo Mufak is your main, main primary teacher, Achlosha Prasa, you have to go 13 kilometers. You've got to drive them most of the way. Wherever they're going. That's the Rambam. Now, Interestingly, the halacha has changed. Things have changed. In most countries, it's safer to travel, right? You know where you're going for the most part. So he says, today, the, uh, the Sman, Chosha Mishpat says, he says, Ha'idna, nowadays, en no again, lalava talmid rabba ad parasa mishum duzman hu mochlen al kavodam. Nowadays, people forego their honor. Yeah, you don't have to go the entire way. V'yashilech imo im chaveru ad you have to go to your gate, or at least four amot, at least six feet or so from your from your gate. Okay, that's people forego their honor, right? It may be it's also dangerous, so you just have to take them out of your gate. You can't just close the door and just walk them four amot. But the Chovetz Chaim says, but don't think just because things are well nowadays and safer. I mean, for most people, not everyone, don't think that this mitzvah doesn't exist. It's still a mitzvah. He says, Aval Khalila liftor et atzma. Heaven forbid that a person should not do this mitzvah, right, and remove it. Ki, the Gemara Mashma, Shu Devasugula. It's not just a physical protection, it's also a spiritual protection given them as well. It's a sugula, he says. Right? Shalo Yara la Asambadar, that something bad shouldn't happen to them. So the physical problem may have gone, and people may give up on their honor, but there's still a, a certain. Pre- there's still a certain amount of um, spiritual protection that comes to them. The gam aladelavia nigmar mitzvah b'shleimut ki eishav rishtevat achila shdi alavia. The fact that Avram Avinu taught this lesson to us means escorting guests isn't just physical; it's also spiritual, and the person should do it. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. And you know there are guests that are rel- that are related to this fest, and I just I don't think out of cruel intention somebody who's organizing the festivity didn't invite the other person that you know should be invited. Yeah. What are you ought to do? Oof. So that's not an escorting question. No. That's an invitation question. Invitation. Yeah. Okay. So you want to throw a party, and someone else is inviting the people for you. Oh, no, no. Somebody else is having a party and they invited you, yes. but they didn't invite somebody else that should be invited. How do you know they should be invited? Because uh, they're throwing up like a birthday party for somebody. And, and say it's obvious they should be invited. Then you should say something. You should say Yeah, to them. So probably, by the way, you know you didn't invite. I don't know if you yeah. wanted to or not. Or, they'll be like, they should, you should tell them. One of the famous stories that led to the structure of the Second Temple actually is reminiscent of that story. So the Kamtsa and Bar Kamtsa. You know the story of Kamsa and Bar Kamsa? No. Very important story. This actually, the Gemara says, is the reason the temple was destroyed. Someone was having a party. And he had two friends, Kamsa, and some say his son, Bar Kamsa. And he wanted one of them to come, because he was his friend. And the other one was his enemy. And he didn't want him to come. 
So he invited Kamsa, his friend. But the guy sent an invitation, invited Bar Kamsa by mistake. So his enemy was invited, but not his friend. It was a mistake, right? Kamsa, Bar Kamsa. So the Gemara says that his enemy turned up, thinking that they were friends again. And the guy, what are you doing over here? And he says, you invited me to party, I don't invite you. Get out. Get out of my party. So Bar Kamsa said, listen, it's embarrassing for me. Can I just stay? I'll pay for what I eat. And he's like, no, get out of my party. And he says, please, I'm a guest in your home. I'll pay for half the food. I'll pay for the half the food for everyone here at the party. But I don't care. Get out of my party. And he says, I'll pay for the entire, just don't embarrass me of all these people. He says, I don't care. Get out. And he left in great shame. The guy was so upset, he ended up reporting to the Romans lies about the Jewish people. He got so upset, he blamed all the Jewish people because the rabbis were there and didn't intercede on his behalf. And he was embarrassed in front of them and because of them. And they say this is one of the reasons the entire temple destroyed. Eventually the Romans got upset with the Jews about this. He ended up making a whole but Loshon Hara about the rabbis and about the Jewish people. And the Romans ended up coming to attack and destroy the entire temple. And they say this story was the reason why. I didn't think of that story, but it fits very well over here. Right? Not having compassion for a guest. All he had to have done was be like, you know what, you can stay. I'll invite the other guy as well. That's all he had to do. That's all he had to do. Maybe the temple will still be standing today. Who knows? That story is the catalyst of destruction. You heard the story before? You heard that before? Very famous story. Every Tisha B'Av, they read that story. Tisha B'Av, we mourn the, the second temple. Okay. We spoke about Yishmael. Let's finish off. Page 57. We learn from Avram Venus hospitality. You have to educate your children. Rashi says, right? Viten al Naar. What do the words mean? He brought his son in. She said, Kaya al Yishmael lechan chob mitzvot. He wanted to educate Yishmael when it comes to mitzvot. Okay? That's what he wanted to do. Right? You want to get your kids involved. Make them do something. Make them prepare food. Lay the table. I don't care if you've got a house full of servants. Right? You've got cleaning people you pay a lot of money to. Getting children involved in Achnas at Orchem trains them to do it themselves. Big mitzvah. Bartham page 58. And let's finish with this. There is great reward for welcoming guests into your home and for escorting them. There is great reward you get for this. In this world and the next world. Move over to so the, the Zohar says, The way you welcome guests into your home, by Alma in this world, So to your soul will be welcomed as a guest into the next world. Mida keneged mida. I'll say that again. Just like you welcome guests into your home, so you'll be, you're going to be a guest one day. Right? One day your soul's going to leave your body, you're going to die, you're going to go to the next world. The way you welcome guests into your home is how your soul will be connected and welcomed into the next world. That's what the Zohar says. Kabbalah. Right? Not only that, but welcoming guests wipe aw wipes away your sins. Dichtiv, it says... Mizbech H. Lash Amad Gavar Archo. It talks about in the book of Ezekiel. The altar was made of wood. It was three cubits. It was two cubits length. It was covered in wood. And they said, This is the table that is before God. Zashul Khan Ashalifni Hashem. This is the altar right? in the temple. Why does it refer to the altar and then call it a shulchan, a table? two different things. So the Gemara says something very, very interesting on this. Gemara and Chagiga. And this is Rabbi Yachanan and Rabbi, uh, Reish Lakish as well. When the temple stood, the altar, the Beit HaMikdash, the altar was where we brought our Karbanot and that atoned for our sins. Nowadays we don't have that. What atones for our sins? Our tables in our homes. So Ezekiel the Prophet was saying that the altar atones. But so does the table. What table? The table in your house. When you welcome guests to eat of the meat in your home and the food in your home, that atones. Right? That's what Rashi says. Shulchanor v'chape alav. The table atones. 
When you welcome guests into your home, you welcome guests into your house, they eat to your table. That table is like the table in the Beit Migdash, the altar, that atoned for sins, your table does too. You want to do Teshuvah, you want to repent for your sins, bring guests into your home. Nice, easy, non Yom Kippur way of doing it. Much easier. The Gemara says, There was actually a famous city called Luz that they couldn't find, right? There's an episode in the book of uh, Shoftim about this. And they saw people leaving and entering a city. So they said that those Canaanites were living in it. And they said that these people were very good escorting. And they said that the people in the city lived a long time because they were very good at escorting people. So there's a connection over there. I'm rushing through it. There's a connection between escorting people and having a long life. Turn over and we'll finish the Rambam. We did a lot today, I know. Page 60. The Rambam says the reward, the reward for escorting a guest is greater than all other types of kindness. Right? And he says, it is the institute of Ahuah Chazuk, Mishchak Avram Vinu. Avram Vinu was one who set it up. The Derech HaChesesh Nagba. Right? It's a tremendous thing you do. Machal over Derachim, feeding people who pass. Or Mashkotan and giving them a drink. Or Malavanotan and escorting them. Gedola Chnasat Orachem, Shachabal of Yashchina. He says, welcoming guests is great because you're welcoming God. Love him, Yotab And when you escort them, it's greater than the hospitality. Helping them leave safely is better than bringing them into your house. It's even better. Because you don't, you're, so you're killing them. So he says, you think hospitality is good? <laughs> Try escort them out of your home? That's even better. That's even better. Okay. We ran out of time. We did a lot today. We will start a new topic, God willing, on Tuesday of the Ahavta Rech Kamocha. Love you, Isaac, you love yourself.